root your feet so that both feet are in the ground or if you are moving stomp your feet so that each step slams the ground drag your tail so that your hips are low as if you have a tail and you are dragging it on the ground play long so that your hands are the first things that contact your opponent. Leverage is advantage, and advantage determines what technique you will use to block your opponent. The read spot is the spot that the back will run to and try to put his feet on. It is the point of attack. You must take steps to protect the reed spot, and we say to take as deep of a step as you need in order to protect the reed spot. The match area has the reed spot to your blind side. In the match area, you either have leverage and want to keep it, or you must step with your inside foot to establish leverage. In the match area, you want to match your helmet stripe to your defender's helmet stripe. The stovepipe is where the reed spot is located. Blockers in the stovepipe want to cover or get in front of defenders. We say that in the stovepipe, your helmet stripe should go past the defender's helmet stripe to his outside number. We want to move the defenders either backwards or out of the stovepipe, and the back will run off of our blocks. In the Apache area, which is furthest away from the reed spot, we want to encircle defenders, which means not to attack them directly, but to establish leverage before we touch them. We can then engage them after we have established leverage in the Apache area. A new concept is the concept of load which means all the forces that you have to fight in order to do work, which is move your opponent. Loads would consist of the body weight of the opponent, your body weight, which you also have to move, and any force that he is putting ne negatively against your positive force. Obviously, anyone directly opposing you is putting out negative force and would increase the load. An example of a light load would be a defender who is not directly opposing you. Usually, you are uncovered and you're going to help someone else. When you are going to attack a light load, you want to use speed and stretch your body. You want to proceed all contact with your hands and try not to contact at all with your headgear. Generally speaking, the forces that you would make when you are doing this against a light load are all hands and usually pushing forces are, are good enough to move a light load. A heavy load is when someone who's big and strong is directly opposing you. Now, just as a light load, you usually have an angle. A heavy load, you usually have no angle. You're head to head or guy's attacking you, okay? He's attacking where you wanna go. A heavy load wants to be moved using tools and rooting your feet. The tools are flipping or torquing to change the direction of the force 
the negative force that the heavy load is putting on you. Okay, we want, in this case, to work with hooks, hooked arms, rather than straight arms and with a light load, hooked arms with a heavy load, to either flip or tear or sling the defender and change his direction. Another idea is the idea of translation, which means to stay square and for all intents and purposes, keep your pecker pointed towards the goal line that you want to go to. We explain to the blockers that they are like a tank moving towards the goal line at whatever angle they have to take. And they don't want to turn the tank, they just want to turn the turret. Just like a tank going down the road doesn't have to turn the whole tank to face an opponent that's approaching him from the side. They can just turn the turret. So the turret is the shoulders and hands and the tank is the hips. When we are translating, we want to stay as square as we can for as long as we can until we can win. So if I'm taking a guy square, covering him up, and I know I've got him wide enough to get him off the read spot, I can then turn to win. Okay, I can turn the tank. If I'm an Apache and I have to encircle a defender, I am going to turn initially or use another technique, which we'll talk about later. And I am going to turn and stay turned until I can win. Pace is another idea that we use quite a bit. And what it says is to go full throttle, rev the motor, but not necessarily or even ever when you're doing work, go full speed. So in other words, low gears. We also say that if you leave an area too soon, it's generally too late to help anybody or protect the area on late penetration or twists. We like to define pace into a stoplight concept where the lights are green, red, and yellow. A green light, when you come to a green light, you go. Green light basically means there's a man in your gap and he's within striking distance of you. You just want to block him. However you block them depends on the leverage, the read spots, match, stovepipe, and Apache. But green light means go get them. Red light means wait. There's nobody in striking distance. You've got to wait until the light changes, until you see somebody in striking distance. Now you might move a little bit. You might go side to side, but basically you're in neutral. You're not going anywhere except for side to side. And you're waiting until somebody's close enough in striking distance or until the light changes. Okay. In other words, someone attra attacks you or you've waited long enough and you say the heck with it. I'm running this late and you go through, get to the linebacker. But you always want to wait at a red light. A yellow light is neither red nor green. When you're approaching a yellow light, you have to make a decision. Should I go green or should I wait red? Okay. What it means is there's somebody in striking distance, but he's not in your gap. Now in gap and zone type plays, we don't want to hit this guy and give up our gap. We don't want to turn to our gap and get hit by this guy. So what we want to do is define this guy, turn him into either a green light by grabbing him and dragging him with us, or turn him into a red light by stuffing him back to the next guy. Okay, so that would become his green light. And now you're red looking for the linebacker, the loopers, the twists, etc. We think that by using the green light, red light, and yellow light analogy, we can explain better the use of tools and techniques. Techniques. Let's start with 
hands and arms. The first technique that we talk about is the W, and we want to use this to push with two hands. We call this pushing with two hands a snap or a hammer. The difference is a snap is a quick elbow extension and a hammer is more of a slam or push using your legs more than your arms. The next position would be a hooked arm, a bent elbow, and we want the elbow to stay locked and bent when we're using a hook. We can hook to flip, or we can hook to, to hook like we're dragging somebody, or a boxer hook to strike. We grab using two hooks, and notice our thumbs are in a V, okay? trying to get this thumbs are in a V so we have two hooks and we grab somebody with two hooks we use mixed hands which is one long arm and one strong arm one what we call stop sign and one hook so we've got a stop sign okay a long arm and a hook a strong arm and together, these mixed hands are very adaptable to different surfaces. We generally use mixed hands to a green light when the guy is in our gap, not directly in front of us, but in our gap. And we have to stretch a little bit to make quick contact. Then we come with a strong arm and we can, we can start to add force to it. As I said before, the stop sign is a long arm and it's kind of a feeler. What we learned is that when you go and make attempt to make contact with two hands, you're generally reaching to strike. Now, if you're in striking distance, go ahead and do it. But the stop sign is before you're in striking distance. Okay, it, you hang it out there to protect yourself and also to gauge when it is that you want to add some force whether it's a light load two hands okay a heavy load mixed hands or a real heavy load double grab uh, stop sign is think of it as a, a feeler the clothesline is just a stop sign for jet alignments guys that are aligned wide enough say you're blocking down on a guy who's on the next man, say I'm a tackle block and I'm down on a guard. I want to clothesline him. I don't want to really point to his number. I want to point to where I think his number is going to go if he penetrates. Okay, so it's sort of like a clothesline. You're going to catch him with that forearm. Okay, just like a, you, you know, Ray Nitschke clothesline. And the other hand is a strong hand. It's mixed hands position. Okay, and generally speaking, when we block down, we go for the far number, not the near number, the far number. Hopefully we get something on the man and then we get our, our strong hand on his hip or his ribs, his back. The defender has handles and the handles are the strongest areas on his body that we can put force into that will not give way to the force and leave his mass behind. It's just like grabbing a heavy load of in a suitcase and having the handle come off when you pick it up. We don't want that. When we put force into a guy, we want to hit his handles. Generally speaking, his handles are under the breastplate of the shoulder pads, in the armpit, which is a very nice place if you can get it, or on his back, above the waistline in his ribs. Okay, those are three ideal places to get contact or impact with your hands in order to put force in, whether you're using force with your hands or locking your arms and using force with your legs. The handles are, are the place you want to control. You never want the defender to touch you in these areas, okay, which is another reason to play long. One more thing on handles. 
The defender's center of gravity is usually on his waistline. If you touch his waistline, it better be a light load or otherwise you're moving a force plus his body. It's hard. When you touch the handles, you've created a lever between his waistline and where the handles are. And that lever you can use to move him, just like you would use a wheelbarrow. He will move because his body is being used as a, it's a lever. Okay. When we really stretch, but not clothesline, we call it a stretch. Okay, we don't need to get in front of a guy because somebody else is already in front of him, but he's far enough away that we can't really get both hands on him. We can't get the tank, on, the turret on him, we, but we still want that clothesline idea. So we're not trying to get to his far number. We're going to go as near to his near side, usually somewhere underneath the ribs, but he's too far away for us to get him with a hammer. So we stretch. A, a, a great coach used to say that's a one hand, two hand read. It's all based on distance. We know intuitively that he's too far away and we will turn too much if we put two hands on him. Now, as we get closer to him and he, he's muddying up the waters, we'll define him with two hands. But basically we want to stretch. And what that allows us to do is not move our feet quite as far, but still afford some protection to our buddy who we're stretching to. The Heisman is just the opposite. Okay, I'm moving, I'm moving to my left and I'm hanging or dragging my right hand off or back. Again, it's just a way of stretching, but it's a, a, a stretch where we're leaving rather than where we're going. Okay, the Heisman is, is, a, is softer. Um, you know, you don't mind getting moved a little bit. You just don't want to get run over and you want to give some presence to the guy that you can't see. Forces that we use, okay, we use boxer jab, okay, and we also use a regular punch and in both of those what we're doing is we're not really doing it with just our arm, we're doing it with our shoulders and our trunk and our hips, okay, we call that a jab. It's a powerful punch when you use both sides of your body. A throw is when we are already engaged. Let's say we're grabbing and we realize that we can throw this guy because he's a light load. We don't disengage both hands, but what we do is pull one hand off, drive that shoulder back and trunk twist and throw just like we're throwing a shot put. Throwing is very powerful. We generally will throw in the match area. Uh, it's hard to throw somebody out of the stovepipe. If you're, if you're tearing him out of the stovepipe or dragging him out and you realize where you're at and then you can get a throw on him, that's good. Flipping is another form of torque, but it's torquing up. Okay, you're using the defender's body like a wheelbarrow and you're flipping him up and trying to stand him up from a crouch position. We think it's very effective because we generally try and get our hands in the handles, which again is a natural lever from the defender's waistline. And we, it's much easier for us to flip, okay, than it is for us to try and just run a guy over. Okay, and what we found was we can flip because of the because of the mechanical advantage of a lever, we can flip, generally speaking, with one hand. So we can do it with mixed hands. Okay. But when we have a real heavy load, okay, grab them and flip with two hands. Slinging is a little bit of a cheat for us, but basically speaking, we're going to grab a guy with mixed hands, okay, a long hand and a strong hand. And we're literally going to root our feet and throw him like we're like we're slinging him on like he's a bale of hay and we're slinging him onto a truck. Okay, just think that you're loading a truck. At one point, I called it dumping a garbage can, but you're slinging him. 
okay? Of course, you've got to have something to grab, okay? Because the sling is, is a centripetal force, and uh, the guy's, you know, he's going to pull away from you. So you want to sling him with, with some kind of cloth grab. The hammer, once again, is putting your fingers in a W. And see the W? You can see my fingers. There's the W right there. And we're just, it's just a little bit of a shoulder, what we used to call it, scapular. Okay, it's not really a, it's not an elbow extension, it's sort of a scapular thing. So we're almost, we're, we're playing long with two hands and we're almost fully extended. And we just want to snap that whole thing. The hammer is very powerful and most of the force comes from the avalanche effect of condensing as you stretch so in other words your hips sink to the ground and the, the leg position allows you to add your body weight to the force you're generating we call that avalanche because it's like you know an avalanche going down a hill but when we hammer somebody it's just that like, okay and it's 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 that shoulder scap um uh, Tunch Ilkin showed it to us years ago. Um, I just turned it into a hammer. Okay. Another force we use is called wrench. And basically, if you're pass protecting and you have a guy who's stepping through, he's, he's under your armpit and he's got his foot past you. And once he gets his foot past you, you're in trouble. What we do is we grab hold of him with the forearm. Okay. Let me get a little bit further away, if I can. Grab him with the forearm, and we step deep, and at the same time with the near arm, we push his hip. And what we're trying to do is pull ourselves or wrench ourselves back in front of him. Okay, so it's a it's an interesting uh, idea. You know, we say we're wrenching the man, but what we're really trying to do is stop the man add our body weight to him which you know st will stop him pretty good in his tracks all of a sudden he thinks he's going through he thinks he's got a light load and he's stepping through and we bah, we clamp ourselves to him and then we deftly step in front of him and wrench ourselves back in front of him the next thing i want to talk about is the rooted positions which means that both feet are rooted into the ground. And our fundamental position is the big tree. And the big tree is, again, let's, your feet are rooted and they're wide, okay, just like a tree. And just understand that, that a tree has roots all the way around, but we only have two roots. So wherever those, the line between those feet, wherever it is, that's the most stable, okay. Uh, in other words, if my feet are parallel, okay, I'm pretty strong side to side, but I'm not very strong front to back. I got to move my roots around. The advantage we have is we're not trees and we can move our roots. We can relocate our roots. But what we want to do is fundamentally root our feet, condense or drag our tail, make us, turn us into a wide rooted, short, stumpy tree with long branches. Okay, so that's the big tree, and the big tree is the fundamental position. Now, a variation of the big tree is sprawling, okay? And sprawling just means taking your roots and putting them negative, in a negative direction against your opponent. So, essentially behind you, so that you've got a mechanical advantage and you can fight his negative force without really moving your feet and you can add other forces with your hands okay sprawling is just like if, if you were wrestling and somebody shot a double leg on you and you you threw your feet back okay uh it's a way to you know it, it, it braces with both feet okay the brick wall is just a staggered big tree so you have one foot positive and one foot negative and obviously you're very strong versus push and pull okay negative 
uh, force against you, you've got the back leg fighting it, and and anybody that's pulling you in a positive direction towards them, you got the front leg fighting it. What we say is it's a brick wall, and the key is again to condense. Okay, if you're brick wall and standing straight up, you're you're not brick wall, and you're just a big like weeping willow that somebody's going to pull over. Okay, you, you must condense your body and make your body short so that he can't use it as a lever. A new one, a new rooted position we call Cossack. And it's like the Russian guys that do the dancing, you know, and what we're doing is we're taking and we're making some, some form of rooted position. Let's say I'm being attacked on this side. Again, the only time I'm stable is when my feet are in line with a force that's attacking me, okay? This force is going through, through one shoulder and out the other. I want to be like a Cossack. I want the far leg straight, and I want the near leg bent and carrying all the weight. So the far leg braces against this defender's force, and the near leg lowers you and condenses you. And what you're going to do there is just take little peepee steps, but basically you're holding ground, okay, in that Cossack, that Russian dancer position, you know, where your guy kicks, he squats down and kicks his feet out like that. Okay, it's Cossack, and it's taken from Cossack squats, which are one-legged squats, um, basically side lunges, okay. All these, uh, except for the big tree, you can, you can say, well, they're lunges, you know. Uh, but uh, that's neither here nor there. The next thing I want to talk about is stepping. And we don't step. Okay, we don't step. We stomp. We stick our feet in the ground. And that maximizes mechanical connection, friction. And it actually, we, when we talk about stomping, I'll say to a kid like this, I'm going to put you on a scale. How much do you weigh? Um, you know, 300, Coach, I eat a lot. Uh, you know, it's chicken wings for lunch. Yeah, okay, great. You're standing on a scale. You weigh 300 pounds. What if you slid your feet around, you know, kick slide? You, you kind of softly moved your feet around the scale. Would the scale go up and down a little bit? Yeah, yeah, Coach, it, it would go up and down. How about if you put your feet up real short and stomped them down on the scale? Boom, boom, boom. What would happen to the scale? What would happen to the weight indication? Oh, coach, it would fluctuate. Yeah. Right. Every time you stomp, it would get heavier. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, coach, that's right. Okay. Well, that's why we stomp instead of step. That's why we stomp instead of glide. The first stomp or step we call a brace step. Okay, we got it from Paul Alexander, the name anyway. Everybody was doing it. He just came up with a great name, the brace step. And what I say to the guys is you're stepping deep or negative to the force you want to make. You want to make positive force towards the goal line, but your, your foot is stepping negative in order to get it behind you to be a brace against your force and the force of the defender, the negative force that he's attacking you with. You need to brace or step deep, as deep as you have to, in order to do the job that you have to do. When you brace, you cannot have your weight go backwards or negative. Your weight must go forwards. And the next foot position that we do is the scoot. And the scoot is simply bracing with both feet in two steps. So if I'm going to scoot right, I'll brace deep with my right foot, and I'll brace deep with my left foot in the same bucket. Now, a bucket is a, you know, it's kind of big, and, you know, there's not exactly, your feet aren't exactly parallel or anything like that. But both feet are sprawled behind you. We scoot to get in front of someone who's not in front of us and who will penetrate. 
The job is to get in front of him first, then move him. Okay? In other words, cover him up, get in front of him so the back can make us right. That's when we scoot. And of course, when we scoot, we like to use mixed hands, okay, a stop sign in order to touch that guy before he gets too much of a head of steam, okay? Also, if we realize that he is slanting or what have you, then that indicator, that length indicator will tell us, well, we better think about a different kind of step because when we scoot with both feet sprawled behind, we are not in contact with the man. We're in a teeter or free fall, a controlled free fall, okay? Both feet are behind us and we're counting on contact. Well, if we can make contact with our hand first, okay, then we're not gonna fall on our face and then we can bring the strong arm later. Pretty good, huh? I like it. The next step is a neutral step that we call a downshift. It's usually used in a red light or yellow light situation. In a red light situation, just to wait and buy time. And in a yellow light situation, to create an angle on the defender. So generally speaking, in a red light situation, there's no one within striking distance. Okay. If we step positive, maybe we get the linebacker, but we sure can't help anybody. If we step negative, we can help people. Okay. But we're turning a little bit. Okay. And it's sometimes you have to do it. Sometimes you have to, it depends on the threat. But if we don't need to step negative to protect our gap, okay, and this is generally speaking red match area, we don't want to step deep, okay, the guy that's next to us is not stepping deep, okay, we want to take a little neutral step, we want to downshift, we want to go from, from uh, this position, boom, boom, Okay, now are your feet directly under you? Is there a little teeter? Uh, you know, uh, whatever. But it's your, your the effort is not to go positive nor negative. Okay, it's to downshift, go neutral. Okay, take it out of gear. The key to downshifting, though, is this: you must condense. If you downshift standing up, you're gonna get hit, and you you cannot. One of the advantages of, of condensing is it's easier for you to change speed. When you're standing straight up, it's, if you're running full speed, great, but it's hard to change direction. Okay, this is called acceleration. Acceleration is changing speed, stopping, starting, or changing speed, or changing direction. Okay, condensing helps you to do that. Okay, it lowers your center of gravity shortens your lever arm and it's easier for you to change your own direction down shifting you're not going anywhere you better be ready to change direction fast okay the shuffle is off of the brace and it's sort of like the same idea as a downshift it starts with a negative step but then it you go neutral and what you want to do is be in a stagger okay if you're going right you want your right foot deeper and this is to protect your gap because you perceive the threat to be coming wide and the wider the threat is the deeper you have to step in order to get in front of that threat should it threaten your gap okay the shuffle is sort of a downshift in, in the way it's neutral and it's and sort of a scoot. And what we do, what we say to the guys is when you're shuffling, make sure you're condensing and be ready to change it into a scoot if you get any color in your face, green light. Okay, shuffle is pretty good stuff. Either the shuffle or the down, downshift are good to change direction. Coming off the downshift or the shuffle is the rewind. And the rewind is literally this. I'm moving to my right and I decide to either plant my feet and rock my weight or literally step back to my left without 
giving up translation. I'm going back where I came from, just as though I'm rerunning a film, and I'm trying to shoulder chip anything that I can give help to. Okay. What we learned about the rewind is we always want to start with our area or start going play side, stop and rewind because it allows the guy that we can't see to get into his block. Generally speaking, if we rewind right away, we shut him off, we knock him off, and we don't want to do that. Okay. Plus, if he can get his guy moving, that guy is on one foot and he's a lighter load. Okay. If we go right now, right, and, and rewind right now, um, we're just, you know, whatever. We're two guys hitting one, which is good sometimes, but gets a little messy at times too. The arc step is when we turn the tank. Okay. We want to turn the tank when we have to get leverage on a guy who's got leverage on us. We only use it in the Apache area. Okay, so in other words, if I have a read spot, if I'm the left tackle and the read spot's over the right tackle, and I've got to block a guy who's to my right, I want to arc, I want to step deep, step deep. I don't want to pivot. Okay, I want to step deep and open my hips and then gallop one step in case I get hit because now I have a braced foot. So if I'm stepping deep with my right foot, and I want to gallop, and we'll talk about gallop in a second, but I want to gallop with my left foot and not cross, not fully take a full stride so that my right foot is now, in essence, behind my left foot. I want to keep my left foot dragging behind so that my right foot can absorb any force that I'm being hit with. Once I can establish that I can do that, okay, once I've encircled with an arc and circle the defender, I can square up because now I have leverage. When I go directly at the defend, defender and not arc, okay, I might hit him, but he, he's got leverage to read spot. And if, he's, if he wants to disengage, well, there's not much I can do about it. I previously mentioned the gallop. And the gallop is simply moving in a stagger, okay? So if I'm moving forwards, okay, and I really have to protect my right side, I want my right foot back, and I want to gallop just like I'm riding a hobby horse, you know, like kid, the horse, the horse head with a stick, okay? I don't want to run. I want to gallop, okay? So if, I'm, if I have my left foot forward, it must mean that I've got a guy that I want to cover to my right, all right? And what it does is it is it allows us to rewind if we want to. It allows us to step deep and arc out of there if the man runs out. It keeps our hips open to, to our most dangerous area, okay? The gallop is also good for a defender that's riding us. If he's riding on this shoulder, okay, I have that foot up and this foot braced. But a Cossack is really what it is. That's where the Cossack came from. Okay. So the gallop is, is essentially an open field block now. Okay. It's a, it's a, a pretty good deal. And uh, I've even seen guys use it in tackling drills with their linebackers. The next two, actually two of the last three, are far foot. Uh, footwork. Okay, one is the skip. And we generally skip on the backside in the Apache area. And if I'm a left tackle, I generally have my left foot back and I want to move that foot first deep and inside in order to go deep and inside. So I'm taking my far foot, okay, and I'm moving it and you could even karaoke behind, but I don't care for that as much as I just, just short of that karaoke and then step deep with the next foot to get an encircle. We started to skip in order to stay square. Okay. There are advantages to it. The main disadvantage to skipping 
is it's hard to stay condensed. Uh, it is a good way to encircle. Absolutely. And the far foot, you cover in two steps. With in, in any other way, you, you're, you're going to take three steps. So it's fast. It's obviously low load. Okay. It's only for one job to encircle. Okay. And of course, when you're encircling, just like when you're arcing, you get square when you can win. When you're skipping, you gain ground when you can win. The next footwork that we use is called the cow tip. And we generally use this as part of our double team, which we call the hay bale. But the cow tip, imagine that you're a right tackle. Okay, you're a right tackle. And you're double teaming to your up foot. Okay, what we realized early on was this. If we step with our near foot, okay, generally speaking, we have to brace to move. It's just the way it is. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get back a little bit further here. It's just so I can show you with the hand work. Okay, so I've got my right foot back. Okay, if we step with the left foot, we're generally going to drop it out of there in order to go. And we're, when we're doing this, we're cow tipping, it's red light. Okay, so we're, we're going there. We have an angle on a guy. But again, the idea is when you brace, it turns you just a little bit. Okay, we want to stay square. So what we do is we take our far foot, our outside foot, and move it to the inside foot. Okay, and I don't know. I don't tell the guys really how far. I just don't want them to cross over. Okay, so it's short of that and then move the inside foot. And at the same time, condense to get that avalanche effect and you're staying square Now you can turn the tank and we we're doing this against a light load we're doing this against somebody who's already tied up with another block and we're going to knock the, the, the stuffing out of them we call it a cow tip because it's it's like there's the cow there's the four-legged animal the defender's got two legs and the blocker's got two legs that's the cow and we want to hit that cow and we don't want to hit him we don't want to hit him in the ribs we want to hit him in the hip we want to tip him and we're going to knock him stupid okay and we're going to do it with our hands and keep our eyes and our pecker pointed at the linebacker the last thing i want to talk about is basically the double team that we use we call it a hay bale and simply it's this i am a blocker and it really doesn't matter who's who, it's, it's really about the read spot. Where's the read spot? Okay, but I'm a blocker who's got a yellow defender. I'm in the I'm in the stovepipe and I want to knock that defender out of the stovepipe. Okay, but he's kind of tough and he's nose up and he's kind of difficult to define. So what I want to do is step into the brick wall. So I want to downshift with my far foot, with my inside foot and then brick wall with my outside foot and you know you'd like to keep the guy in front of you and you want to you want to grab him now the wider he is towards where you're going the more you want to use a mixed hand so you can do this against a guy who's shaded toward towards where you're going it's just that he's not shaded enough for you where you feel confident so what you say to your buddy over here is hey bill so you downshift Okay, and usually it's this, you downshift and step into him and make a, make yourself into a brick wall. Usually if it's yellow, okay, you can grab him and you just want to play long and give your buddy access to hit him. You want to be a brick wall. You don't want to get moved and you don't want to try and drive him back. You don't want to do it. That's the biggest mistake. You want to condense and eat up all of his negative force so that your buddy who comes to cow tip him with a far foot work just blasts him okay and once he blasts him you'll feel it and you take him and just throw him on the truck like he's a bale of hay or swing him and drive him and that's the hay bale it's pretty simple of course your guy cow tip and he can square up we generally only want to do this if he has got 
he's cow tipping to the linebacker. Okay. We don't want really cow tip if he's cow tipping away from the linebacker. He wants to have the linebacker and the guy he's tipping in the same line. Okay. Does that make sense? Well, it makes sense to me.